Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to discuss model selection, which is part of our model develop series. So one of the biggest mistakes I see from like students who just graduated or people who aren't really model developers or have a lot of experience is they dive right in and they have some model idea in their mind and they want to build this model. But the thing is, is that's not how models are developed. The data should determine what model you select and more or less how you end up creating the final model structure. So the first thing to look at is the dependent variable. So what are you modeling? The second thing to look at is, is the dependent variable qualitative or quantitative? So quantitative would just be numbers. Uh, qualitative would be something such as gender. So you have male and female. There is no numerical value. You'll have to transcode these into a numerical value. However, it is qualitative data. Uh, whether it is quantitative or qualitative will help you decide on what type of model to use as well as the data type itself. And so when you look at a variety of models, a lot of times people get all excited and they use like a model, for example, like OLS, and then they skip OLS though and they jump into like weighted least squares and they're going to create this really cool model, but they forget that the whole reason we're using weighted least squares in this example would be because some of the assumptions of OLS were violated. And so I think, as you'll see later on, I have at the end kind of a web. It's kind of my decision tree that I have in my brain on how I select my models. But basically when you move from node to node, it's because there's some tests. So you pick the simplest model first, and then if you end up failing some of the assumptions behind the model, then you should move on to a different type of model that helps correct for these assumptions that are violated. So today we're only gonna cover a few of the types of models, some of the most popular models, and we're gonna discuss the overview of how you select that model structure. And then in later videos, we'll discuss how to do the variable selection, model fitting, and other different criteria behind developing a model. So again, in my opinion, there are five types of data. These five types of data will help you determine more or less the model that is the best for your situation. Situation. There is continuous data, there is categorical data, there is time series data, there is pooled and panel data, and there is curve fitting and surface fitting. So next to each one of these types of data, you can see a suggestion of different types of models that would go with this different type of data. And as it says at the bottom here, as a disclaimer, many other types of models exist. However, I'm not covering them all. So this is by no means a list of all types of models in each of these categories. It is just a general selection of popular models. So in this presentation, we're not going to be covering the paneled and pooled data and curve and surface fitting. So if you go back to the basic model types, the pooled and panel data, examples of these models would be first difference models, fixed effects, random effects, and mixed effects. And curve fitting and surface fitting is something such as splines, low S, and kernel density. Here's an example of a kernel density here. Um, just adjusting the fitting parameter gives you these two different curves and being able to fit these is very crucial as there is no right and wrong answer. It is very much an art as it is a science. Uh, great examples of this, which I'm not going to cover, is fitting uh, volatility, smiles, and smirks and derivative modeling. And when you do this in graduate school, typically you start out with something that is two-dimensional. And so you see kind of like a Nike swoosh drawn on the sheet, and that's what you're modeling. And then as you actually put this into three-dimensional modeling, you can actually build surfaces, which you can see the smirks, but they kind of shift over time and have different characteristics based on the different attributes of the derivative itself. And so if you're actually looking for more of this information, I would suggest that you Google Jim Gatherall. He is the leading expert, or at least one of the leading experts in volatility modeling. And you can read a lot about modeling these in both two dimensions and three dimensions. So the most popular type of data is continuous data. This is just standard numerical data. It's quantitative in nature. Um, it's used for anything from academics to finance to more or less anything you can think of as probably continuous data. Uh, the most popular model for this is ordinary least squares. There are five assumptions behind OLS, and this is linear in the parameters, random sampling, sample variation in the explanatory variable, zero conditional mean, and homoscedasticity. So if any of these five assumptions are violated, you're going to have a trade-off between bias and variance within the estimators themselves, and so it is best to move on. One of the most popular things that is violated is the homoscedasticity assumption, and when this is so, you can move on to something such as weighted least squares, general least squared, or feasible general least squares. I'm not going to go into the differences in them right now, however, this is one example where one of the assumptions is violated and therefore you need to move on to a different model. However, if none of these five assumptions are violated, you should be going with OLS. 
I know it is simple. That is the beauty behind OLS is it is as simple and you should always select the simplest model possible. Do not overcomplicate things unless you absolutely have to. And so OLS in itself can be linear or nonlinear. You can add nonlinear variables into your OLS regression. Uh, this changes some of the model in itself and you can look into the details as well. Um, another example that I love to see, which people are kind of amazed on, is that yes, you can use OLS for time series. There is ways to adjust OLS and make sure that the OLS is appropriately fitting in time series and that OLS can be used in a time series application. So this is an example of a typical univariate regression in OLS. I think most people view this as like it's boring, there's this straight line through the middle, and then OLS sucks and it can't do a very good job. Um, on the bottom here, you'll notice there is the equation, the typical notation of writing this linear equation. However, if you look at the second chart, you can see when you have multivariate OLS, uh, the two variables that are the independent variables will actually interact together and you can create curves and different curvature within the model so you don't end up with that boring typical OLS fit that you learn in your undergraduate stats 101 class. So now let's move on and say your dependent variable is categorical. So this can be either qualitative or quantitative. Like I mentioned before, it could be something such as male and female, which would be a qualitative variable because there is no number that goes with these. You'll have to code these typically as zero and one, and then you can use something like a logistic model. So there are a variety of different models for categorical. However, in general, I consider these logistic style models. Um, you can have a logit, a probit, a tobit, and there's all kinds of variations you can add into here. For example, there is a logistical growth model. There's all kinds of models you can do with logistics. However, logistics is amazing and great because you can actually fit models for these different categories. One example of this that is used in finance is the probability of default. The probability of default obviously can only range from 0%, that there is a zero probability that you're going to default, all the way up to a 1% probability that you're going to default. So the thing is, this is a bounded or problem, meaning that the number or the output has to fall between zero and one. Logistics does an amazing job at fitting these types of models because any value that it outputs will be between zero and one. And one of the biggest kind of conundrums and complaints I have in general with logistics is that people are convinced that logistic regression has zero assumptions behind the model. I think this is very laughable in the fact that it is a model and all models have assumptions. So I have not seen a definitive list like there is for OLS. However, for logistic regression, there are four main assumptions that I view and see, and I have seen these violated. The first one is that there is a binary dependent variable, meaning there is a category, something that is predicting that is categorical, it cannot be continuous. The second one is that you have a random sampling. So if your data is not randomly sampled, and yes, people say this is ridiculous, this is so simple, all data is random, but it is not. People skew the results to get the results they want from their model. So random sampling is the second one. Linear dependent and transform independent variables. Once the link function is applied, there must be a linear relationship between the dependent and independent variables. And the fourth one, which I cannot stress enough, is large population. So in finance and credit modeling, there are different rules of thumbs. However, when you model defaults and loans, you have goods and you have bads. So first off, we want a large enough population that we're covering as many people as possible and are going to get a representative sample of our customers. The second part, which a lot of people miss, is that you need big enough populations of each category. So we have two categories in defaults. You have people that do default and people that don't default. The rule of thumb I have seen is that you want a minimum of 200 bads in your portfolio. I would also imply the inverse logic, which is there must be a minimum of 200 goods in the portfolio that you're modeling as well, or in the data that you're using to model. So having a large population is not necessarily just the total population, but also your categorical categories that you're modeling need to have large enough populations as well. So here is a plot of a typical logistic or sigmoid curve. Um, you can see here on the bottom and the top, there are data points that are either zero or one. Below is also the formula here for the logit regression. Um, again, I have structured this in the sense that it looks like a linear regression, so that you have the alpha plus beta on x1 plus you know beta to the n xn all the way plus your error term, and that will give you your general logit function. You can reorganize this so that you have the probability is equal to 
an equation. However, it is not as pretty and nice and does not look like a linear regression such as OLS, and I prefer to keep it in this format. And as a side note for using logit or logistic regression, in credit modeling, I have seen people model probability of default with ordinary least squares. So yes, your dependent variable is supposed to be between zero and one. However, I have seen a few papers stating that OLS does a good job and sometimes a better job than logistic regression when used correctly. And so one of the issues with this is that there's a possibility of you having values that are less than zero and greater than one. Um, the way they handle this in implementation for the model is that values that are equal to or greater than one are just set to one or to 0.95, for example. So some maximum threshold is selected. And then also the minimum is held in a similar fashion where the value is moved. If it's negative, it is moved to a value slightly greater than zero. And in practice, it is not very likely to have an actual probability of zero or one. And so that is why a threshold is picked that is slightly less than one and greater than zero when the values fall outside this bound. However, in general, it would be best practice to start with logistic. If you find some paper or some proof stating that OLS does a better job, I would consider building two models and then reviewing the results of both of them and seeing how they perform against each other. But again, the simplest solution here would be to select logit or a logistic regression because of the dependent type of data. So the third main category we're going to cover is time series. And I absolutely love time series. Um, I view this as my specialty. My first job was building time series models and implementing time series models. So I have somewhat of a bias toward time series over different types of models. But what makes time series data is the fact that the data has time stamps and it has to be in a specific order. So for example, with continuous data, you can sort the data any way you want and it makes no difference because you're going to get the same results. However, time series data has to have this time stamp and be in a specific order. Good examples of this are economic data. For example, stock prices are time series data. There is a stock price for January 1st, January 2nd, January 3rd, all the way through December 31st of that year, and you can keep going year after year after year. One of the key factors behind time series as well is that the timestamps are evenly spaced. Um, for example, stock prices, this is not always true. We have to make the assumption that the time step is the same length. And so the first thing to look at with time series data, or at least the first thing I look at, is the serial correlation. Is the data serially correlated? If it is not, you can go back and model time series with OLS. If it does have serial correlation, then you should move on to testing the stationarity. If the data is stationary, then you would go on to check for heteroscedasticity. If the data is heteroscedastic, then you'd move on to a GARCH model, which would help handle the assumption that is violated that the data should be homoscedastic. If the data is homoscedastic, though, you can use a ARIMA model or a Nui West correction to the OLS model. So again, using OLS is simple, it's easily understood by many people, and sticking with it, even with a correction, can be a better option many times. And then if you go back to the stationarity test and you failed the stationarity test, then you need to consider differencing the data to make it stationary. If differencing the data or doing a log transformation makes the data stationary, then you can go back to testing the heteroscedasticity and you can either choose your ARIMA or GARCH based on that decision. However, if the data is not stationary, it cannot be made stationary, which is definitely possible. Uh, good examples of this are HPI, so the house pricing index. You can difference it many times and it will not become stationary. The next test, if it is not stationary, is to look at the co-integration. If the independent variable is co-integrated with the dependent variable, and the residuals are stationary, you can use a model such as an error corrective model or a vector error corrective model, ECM or VECM. If the data is not co-integrated and it is not stationary, you cannot build a model with the variables you have in the model and the dependent variable that you're modeling. And so the issue here is that you need to go back to the drawing board and start over. I have seen many, many people say, you know, Dimitri, I need to model this. I want these variables in the model. It's not stationary, I have all these issues. And so therefore I'm just going to use the model. Well, I can tell you your model is going to fail probably in one or two prediction periods out that your model is predicting because it is not stationary. And I'm not going to go into the details of stationary right now. However, stationarity is one of the biggest keys in modeling time series data. And so here's an example of some data using an ARIMA model. You can see it has a cyclical pattern within the data. Um, the blue data points in the blue line is the historical data. The red portion of the line is the forecast. So the advantage of using time series is that time matters. So you can forecast so many periods beyond that time point. 
And so typically time series plots are viewed this way where you have the data that the model is built on, which is the blue historical data. And then you have, for example, in my case, a red forecast, which shows you the forecast that the model is predicting. If the forecast is asinine and has no sense to it, the model sucks. I don't really care what the residual mean squared error is, and many people will reside on the fact that it fits well. However, using an ARIMA model is very tricky because selecting the right AR, MA terms, and the number of differencing is crucial for creating a stable model. And on the bottom here again, you can see the formula. Uh, writing out a time series or a REMA model looks a little scary at first, but it's not so bad, especially when you start programming these in a program such as SAS, R, or Python. So this chart I know is hard to see, but I view this more or less in a web format. So I get the data when I do the model selection. But I look at the dependent variable first to see what type of data I have. This determines the type of model I will be using. So is it continuous data? If so, I'm going to use an OLS model and go down that trail and figure out what assumptions are violated and if I need to move on. If not, I'll stick with the OLS model. Is the data categorical data? If the dependent variable is categorical, then I will go on to look for a logistic style model. I will typically choose Logit or Probit. I will review the base assumptions behind this model and I will select the model appropriately. If the dependent variable is a time series and it matters across time, I will select a time series approach. Again, I will first test the serial correlation to see if I can move back to OLS. If not, I'll move on to testing stationarity and moving on to heterostasticity tests to select either an ARIMA, a GARCH, or an ECM model. And then pooled and panel data is a type of time series data. It is data that is taken in large samples within different specific time periods. And if that is the case, I will dive in and look at the assumptions behind the different models and analyze which model I should use, whether it's a first difference, first fixed effects, random effects, or mixed effects. And then finally, if I'm just fitting a set of data, there's going to be no predictions, no new data being added into the data set itself. I will consider per fitting or surface building. Again, estimating distributions, for example, using kernel estimators is another way to do this. And there are many, many different approaches that are specific for each scenario. There are a variety of other types of topics, guys. I'm just not going to cover these but you get the gist here. So again, in my opinion, there are five types of dependent data. You need to figure out what your dependent data type is before you can select your model structure. The model itself will determine which model you should be using. So the final conclusion on the model selection and structure is you need to look at your dependent variable, look at the different types of data I've covered in this video, and then use that to help you determine which type of model you should build. Model selection is not black and white. And again, like the example I mentioned in the logistic model, um, probability of default of loans, for example, can be used with logistic or probit based on this model structure. However, there have been papers written on how OLS outperforms it in some scenarios. So again, it is not black and white. If you have an inkling that there's another type of model out there that would do a better job, I would encourage you to build both models, compare the results, and also look at the assumptions behind each model to make sure you're not violating any key assumptions. So again, once you determine your dependent data type, then it is crucial to look at all the assumptions and test the assumptions and kind of go down that web or that path that will help you determine the best model for the data you have. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. This is just a brief overview on selecting the best model structure. In future videos, we're going to cover more details on actually building models and testing the assumptions behind them. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you like my comment, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time. Thanks for watching my video. If you find it helpful, please like, share, and subscribe.